Okay, so a few people are still joining, but I'll just start the talk. Um, I'm just going to give a brief overview. So um, really, the idea of this quiz was to, um, to uh, rather than looking at advanced MPI functionality, was to basically ask some questions about the basic functions. And in fact, um, you might be surprised that um, you know, there are in, in the standard operation when you have a matching send and a matching receive and everything's going fine, then it's quite obvious how sort of MPI, MPI functions. But in other situations, even with these straightforward call send and receive, it might not be obvious what goes on. So I want to look at what actually happens in standard usage, maybe basically even the simple situation, drill down a bit and um, find out what happens there. But also in more complicated situations, in um, uh, you know what actually happens if things don't match in various different ways and, and how does MPI cope so why well understanding the defined behavior of MPI can be very helpful in ensuring your MPI programs function correctly in all possible circumstances it is quite useful to have in the back of your mind what goes on now in fact um, MPI is designed so that normally everything just works straight out of the box, but it is often being useful to be aware of what happens in maybe more unusual situations. So what I'm going to do now is I'll actually um, I'll actually share the quiz page and we'll start doing the um, the actual quiz. So. Okay, so I'll just be able to advance to the. Um, so the first question. So the important point about the questions is that there may be more than one correct answer. So um, this, uh, you can slightly game the system actually because if there are two two correct answers, it will only let you click. Uh, um, it will only let you select two um, actual uh, options. But it would be good if people could. Uh, uh, have a go at this question. Obviously, a warm-up question. I've already had one warm-up question, but um, and if you have any, the other, and I said the other point was I did want to promote discussion. So, please, if you have any questions, or in some of the later questions, actually, you may disagree with my answers. There are a couple of questions where. Um, it's not immediately obvious what the right answer is. I'm just trying to explore some things. So, please. Um, questions into the chat window as we go along if you want to discuss anything okay so I'm just slightly confused about the attendance figures okay but fine um, so if we look at that question fine so um, most people got that MPI stands for message passing interface, which is also a way of doing distributed memory parallel programming. The only reason for having that question there was just so that there was there was more than one uh, more than one option. Okay, fine. So we'll go on to the next question. So this is first question. To compile and run an MPI program requires. Is it special compiler, special library, a special parallel computer, a special operating system? Okay, so we seem to have a lot of answers there. So let's go on to the, how did we do? So the reason I asked this is, it's again, um, none of these questions are um, trick questions. What I, what I mean is all the answers are perfectly reasonable answers. And so um, the right answer here was special libraries. Now, a lot of people will say special compilers. And that that's a perfectly reasonable thing to say because when you, um, um, when you, um, if I click on the explanation there, um, when you compile an MPI program, you, you, you type MPI CC or MPI F90 or MPI C++, so it appears you have a special compiler, but it isn't. In fact, MPI is a library, an external library, and doesn't require any compiler support. Now, these 
what appear to be MPI compilers that you run are just wrappers. They're just wrappers around on your laptop, the GNU compiler, on, 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 on Archer, the Cray compiler, and they just link in a few libraries. So in fact, um, MPI doesn't require special compilers. The way it's set up makes it look like they're special, but they're not. MPI is just a library. You don't need a special parallel computer because all computers are now parallel. Well, in fact, um, you can run MPI on any machine. The reason being that MPI is based on processes and all modern operating systems, Windows, uh, Mac OS, uh, the Mac OS X or Linux, any Unix system can run multiple processes at once. So you can actually run an MPI program on a, on a single core machine because you can run multiple processes. So you don't need special compilers, you just need special libraries. Although the way that MPI is set up, it does appear that you're running special, that you're running special compilers. So if, like I said, if anyone has any comments or questions, please just type into the chat window. So the next question is, you initiate an MPI program with MPI run minus N for my MPI program or on the crate, or maybe AP run minus N for my MPI program. And then one of the first things you'll do is call MPI init. What does the MPI init call do? Does it create the four parallel processes? Does it start program execution? Does it enable the four independent programs to communicate with each other? Does it create the four parallel threads? As I said, none of these answers are stupid answers in the sense that in, in a message passing system, if I told you I, I've created this message passing system, all of these would be perfectly reasonable behavior. It just happens to be an MPI. MPI makes a particular choice about these. And that's what I'm exploring in this tutorial. What is MPI's choice for these situations? But actually, all of these outcomes are perfectly reasonable outcomes. I think there's maybe a couple. If you don't know the answer, just guess because it's all anonymous, at least unless you've put your name in. So how did we do? OK, so the right answer is enables the four independent programs subsequently to communicate with each other. What that means is, I don't know if you see the explanation. Can someone um, type in? I, I get a slightly different view of this. I, I, if I click there, you can see the explanation. But can, can someone tell me, do you see that explanation by default when you when you answer? No, you don't. Okay, fine. So I no. Okay, fine. So I can reveal it there. I'll reveal the explanation. And make sure I do. So the important point is that when you type MPI run, these MPI launchers create multiple copies of your MPI executable. Each is a separate process. So you can actually MPI run a serial program. It will run four copies of your serial program. So the four parallel processes are initiated by MPI run. So there are already four parallel processes running. What happens at runtime is once you call MPI init, they get together and talk to each other. But the four parallel processes are actually created by the MPI run command, not the MPI init command. And create the four parallel threads I'm not usually a stickler for terminology, but it is important that threads and processes are different, and MPI is based on processes. Uh, people seem to be a bit lax these days about saying thread or process, but they are different. MPI is based on processes. Processes cannot share memory with each other. Something like OpenMP is a threaded model. It's based on threads, and threads can share memory. And M OpenMP, you have the concept of shared or private memory. In that, con in that terminology, in MPI, all memory is private. So um, again, all of these behaviors would have been perfectly reasonable behaviors for some generic message passing system, but MPI takes um, a different, a particular approach. So the next question, I'm going to talk about send and receive in rather gory detail. If you call I receive and there is no incoming message, what happens? Does it fail? Does it report there's no incoming message? Does it wait forever, potentially, or does it time out? Again, all of these are perfectly reasonable behaviors, but in a message passing system, but what does MPI do? Okay, see what people say. Okay, so actually everyone got it right. Whoever answered the receive waits until the message arrives, potentially waiting forever. So that's actually quite an important point about MPI. Um, this is related to the fact that this surprises a lot of people. Uh, you would think, well, if there's no, you know, isn't it silly to wait forever? But MPI's model is that you've written a correct program and correct programs will run correctly. MPI's model is also that the hardware, MPI isn't fault tolerant, so it assumes that the hardware is always up and running. If you are writing a message passing system for 
uh, a machine which was very which might fall over all the time you would want to receive to time out because the sending process might be running on a computer that died and so if you're writing a fault tolerant message passing system this would not be a sensible behavior but mpi assumes the hardware is 100% reliable and therefore it assumes you it also assumes you've written a correct program so if you issue a receive it will wait forever uh, until the message comes in and if you if there is no message coming in of course we get the problem that we get deadlock so on the other side, on the send side, if you call MPI synchronous send, MPI send, and there is no receive posted, what happened? So MPI synchronous send is like making a phone call. Um, um, that's why the synchronization. But you, you issue an MPI synchronous send, and there's no receive posted. Um, what what might happen? The send. What happens here is the send waits until the receive is posted. So M synchronous send is like making a phone call. Making a phone call, you pick up the phone and you wait for someone to pick up at the other end. Now you might say, well, if I make a phone call, there's nobody on the other end, surely I should time out. Well, again, MPI assumes that the hardware is 100% reliable and that you've written a correct program. So again, this is where you can get deadlock. The send waits until the receive is posted and if, there's no, if there is no um, receive, it waits forever. Now, it's important to realize that you might say, that seems a bit strange, but the important point is in MPI, all the processes are running independently. So it's actually very difficult to say, well, I know that the sender is being called before the receiver because they're running at different speeds on different computers. And so that's why MPI takes this attitude. It's saying, well, you may think the receiver has been posted in advance, but actually maybe that process has gone to sleep for half an hour. And so it's because the send waits for the receive and the receive waits for the send that MPI works. It's that, that they wait for each other. It's actually kind of a basis for, for the reason that MPI actually actually works uh, in most situations. So um, you might say, well, I never do synchronous send. Well, we'll come back to that. That's it. So the next question is, if you call a buffered send, B send, and there is no receive posted, which of these are potential outcomes? Now, a buffered send um, is like um, sending a letter. It's an asynchronous send. So I mean, um, um, it, it, it's the it's it's if if synchronous send is like making a phone call, buffered send is like making an asynchronous send. Again, you might say to yourself, "Well, I've never called. I've neither called synchronous send nor buffered send in my life. Why are you asking these questions about routines I've never called?" Well, I'll come back to that later because there's a, the the next question illustrates a subtle, well, moderately subtle point that people don't um, maybe don't uh, recognize. So I said, if you don't know, just guess. I think most people have answered. Okay, how did we do? Okay, so, so um, if I would, so the three correct answers were actually. I'm getting confused with multiple windows. Um, that. D and D and F. So D and F are the correct. And the message is stored and lived later on, if possible, which is like sending a letter. And also the sending process continues execution regardless of whether the message is received. So both of those are the same as posting a letter. You go, you post the letter into the letter, watch you come back and carry on with your life, whether or not the receiver has been posted. However, actually the last time I gave this quiz, um, I made a mistake. And so B is not obviously a correct answer, but B is a potentially correct answer. Potentially, the resend can fail. And um, this I actually um, I actually got wrong. Uh, myself but the reason the send can fail is the MPI buffered send is mandating that you're doing a buffered send it's mandating the MPI takes a copy of the message and it's slightly um, confusing but it's up to you to um, it's up to you to um, ensure that there is sufficient buffer space and uh, the buff if the buffer space runs out, then the send can fail. So asynchronous send is like posting a letter or sending an email. It completes as soon as the message has left the sending process, but it requires to be buffered and it's up to you to provide the buffer space. And sometimes this buffer space can run out. So actually the send can potentially fail, which is, so the next question is, if you call MPI send and there's no matching receive, which of the following are possible outcomes? And actually the lead up questions have really been leading up to this. Um, you know, MPI send is the standard send routine, which most people use. It's called the standard send. Um, 
the question is what happens so we've seen what happens with synchronous send if you call synchronous send then the send waits forever and there's no receive if you call buffered send there's a number of behaviors most likely what happens is the message is buffered and posted later on but in fact it can technically fail that was a um uh, but 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 the standard send mpi send what happens if you call it and there's no matching receive So, um, the important point here is that the MPI standard send um, can and can be implemented as either. You're not seeing this, are you? There we are. The MPI standard send can be implemented as either synchronous send or buffered send, and you don't know which. And so you'd think that the outcome would be all the possible answers from the previous, from questions six and seven. And that's true. If MPI send is implemented as synchronous send, then the correct answer is um, C, the send waits until the receiver is supposed to potentially waiting forever. If MPI standard send is implemented as buffered send, then D or F are the possible outcomes. However, what, what, will, ha what, what will not happen is B. And the reason that B will not happen is the, the, the um, the rationale here is that MPI decides the best way to send a message if you issue a standard send. And so what MPI normally does is it tries to buffer it. It says, that, well, I'll try and squirrel the message away so that the program can continue. However, if it doesn't have enough buffered space, buffer space, it blocks, it becomes, a, it becomes synchronous send. So it switches between asynchronous and synchronous depending on whether there's buffer space available. And so the, the recommendation is that MPI programmers should use MPI send. You're allowing MPI to, to decide whether um so i'll come back. so yes um i think fiona um you you should be able if there are multiple if multiple answers are required if i'm sorry if multiple answers are true you should be able to select multiple answers what i mean is if there's two correct answers you can click up to two right ones if you click a third one it will deselect one so you can kind of game the system you can click as many as you think are correct and then it'll stop allowing you to click. So you can kind of, does that make sense, Fiona? I don't know if, um, so so you know, all the questions have have one or more than one possible correct answers. I want you to kind of decide which, but you can actually game the system by just clicking until it stops accepting any more. Okay, yes, so um, I, I kind of, um, I, I kind of wanted people to have to guess that. So yeah, we, um, so um, that so, so the, the the problem is that most a lot of people assume that MPI send is buffered. That it's like posting a letter. However, for large messages, it isn't. And so you see a lot of incorrect programs where people have assumed that once they've called MPI send, their that the sender will carry on execution regardless of whether there's a receive been posted, and that is not necessarily true. So it was kind of that was sort of really what I was trying to get at. The MPI send very very simple. Um, you know, possibly the third MPI function you ever used, the behavior, whether does it buffer the message and carry on? Does it wait for the receive to be posted? You don't know. And you need to be able to cope with both cases. And the most, the, the case which is likely to cause you issue, the, the case which is likely, which may cause deadlock is if MPI send becomes synchronous and you have to, you have to work with that. And the normal way to get around that is to use MPI send, to use the non-blocking form. Okay, so I'll go on to the next question. The next question is about receive. The receive, uh, the receive routine has a parameter count. What does this mean? So you'd MPI receive uh, buffer count data type, or is it buffer data type count? Buffer count. Anyway, when you issue a receive, you, you, you have a count. What does that mean? Is it the size of the incoming message in bytes? Is it the size of the incoming message in, in say, integers? Is it the size you've reserved for storing the message in bytes or the size you reserve for storing the message in integers, say in integers, for example? Okay, so how did we do? So, um, so both, both, everyone got it right that it's not in bytes. So that is um, an important point that uh, MPI tries to avoid talking about bytes. So that was good that everyone realized it was in inside of objects, integers or or, or um, in integers, not like. However, um, actually, I'm, most people got the right answer, which is actually very good, because most people think that n 
the count is the size of the incoming message in items easy integers. It's not. Formally, when you do an MPI receive, you say, I would like to receive a message from process seven, for example. You do an MPI receive with, with um, source equals seven. But when you say seven, int uh, sorry, if you say five integers, can't it, what you are saying is, and I have reserved enough space locally to store a message of size five integers. It is not saying that the incoming message is of size five integers. It's saying you've stored enough space locally to store a message of up to five integers. Now that might seem like a slight technical difference, technical point, but it, it does have ramifications. And that's the next question. What happens if the incoming message is larger than count? You said, I'd like to receive a message from somebody. I have reserved five integers for the incoming message. What happens if the incoming message is actually bigger than that? So most people seem to have made up plump. So how did we do? So most people have gone for only the first count items are received. In fact, the right answer is the receive fails from there. Now I can understand why most people said D because it's very unusual at runtime for MPI to do any checking for you. MPI, pro, uh, MPI off, typically doesn't check very much, but this is where one case it does check. It will say, if you have reserved space for five integers and the incoming messages of size seven or 10, then it will fail with an error. It will say, I cannot receive that message. Now, if, if the behavior with D, only the first count items are received, that seems like a reasonable thing. If you think about it, that would be a bit problematic because you would have not, you would have, the receive would have completed, but you wouldn't have received all the data. Um, and what would have happened to the extra items? So I, actually the choice between A and D, you might argue is a bit of a toss up actually, but for right or wrong, um, and I think it's probably the right decision, MPI picks A. And if you get the situation at runtime, you will probably see a runtime message saying, out of buffer space or incoming message too large or something like that. So it's one of the few times you get a, um, a, a, a useful instructive error message from MPI. So again, even the simple send and receive aren't necessarily as simple as you might think. Now, in a, if I show the explanation, um, yeah, MPI checks that the um, incoming message will fit the supply storage before receiving it. And the standard behavior is most if you if there's any error detected on an MPI routine it, it crashes and burns typically so your, your program will crash in the default setup but you will get a, a reasonable answer a reasonable sorry, a reasonable error message the obvious next question is what happens to the incoming message of size and is smaller than count I've said they want to receive a message and I've reserved five integers and then message comes in it's only one integer what happens then okay so most people have had a Plump. So, ah, so everybody got this right. The first N items are received. That's very good. So um, this is entirely legal. So as, I, as it says in the example here, in simple programs, you often know the size of all the messages. This is why um, people have done very well to get this question right. This is why a lot of people get this wrong, is that people have never thought of this situation. They've said, well, in every MPI program I've written, if I send eight integers, I never want to receive eight integers. But in some programs, you can imagine you don't know what the size of the message you're going to send is. And that's why MPI has this behavior. It says, look, if you don't know how much data you're going to send, you're allowed to reserve a lot of space to accept a big message, but if a smaller message comes in, that's completely legal. So that was very good. People got that right. The first N items are received. So I've issued a receive asking, saying, I want to receive a message, and I'm receive, I've, I've reserved 10 integers for it. The message comes in, and it's only five integers. Well, that's a bit of a problem because the, the, the receive is completed correctly, but how do I know how much has been received? So how is the actual size of the incoming message reported? So clearly, if MPI completes the receive successfully, even if the incoming message is smaller than the buffer you've reserved, you would want to know that. If you've reserved space for 15 integers and you only get 10, you kind of need to know you've only got that. How do you, how do you get that, um, mess, that information? Okay, so someone says, does this mean the rest of the storage is not changed or the state of the rest of the storage is undefined? I think I actually had that as one of the answers. Um, the rest of the storage is not changed. Um, 
so that's a very good point so it's not i think one of my one of my things was it was zeroed so the rest of storage is not changed so you know if you've got a buffer and you only receive the first bit of it it's guaranteed it will overwrite that first part but the remaining part is unchanged that's actually a good maybe you should have that as an option um that's the, the rest of the storage is guaranteed to be is guaranteed to be unchanged it is not undefined so that's a good point actually you could it could have said you know the, the rat mpi could have said look You've given me this space. I can do whatever I like with it, but it's guaranteed that it is it is unchanged. So what that allows you to do is you could you could receive data and you could receive some data from somebody and then um, actually I'm trying to think of a situation where this would be useful. Um, it's hard to think of a, a situation where that would be, um, but my understanding is that that the rest of the data is unchanged. So let's see how people did. Okay, so MPI can tell you, because if you think about it, it will be quite hard. If, if you have a situation where the size of the messages aren't known and the receive completes correctly with a, um, a smaller message, the only way to get around that would be if, if MPI didn't know, then you would just have to, every time you sent a message, you have to send a subsequent message which said, by the way, I just sent you five inches or something like that. MPI can tell you and it stores it in the status parameter. So every receive in MPI specifies two storage locations. One is the, the receive buffer, which is what we've been talking about here, but the other is which where the data goes. But any message has, just doesn't have data, it has metadata. So if I send a letter, the data is the contents of the letter, but the metadata is the stuff on the outside, like you know, the address and maybe where it came from, and you know, might be stamped what data it was posted. And MPI stores this metadata in the status parameter. So that's the reason you, you, you specify a status parameter, which in, 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 in C is a, is a little structure, and Fortran, at least in the old fashioned version, is a little array. It allows MPI to also tell you, well, by the way, the message was of so long. And the other kind of stuff which is stored in the status parameters, not just the length of the incoming message, but where the message came from. Again, you know, may know where it came from, but you could wildcard. You could do a receive with MPI any source, and then you would receive a message, and then MPI would store the, the information as to where the message came from in the status. So again, many programs don't, don't consult the status, but it is there. So, now I'm going on to some more contrived examples, but what I've got here is I'm doing two synchronous sends. I'm going to investigate the use of tags. And the reason I'm asking these questions, I want to ask a question about message ordering. Message ordering in MPI is, is actually um, maybe something you've never thought about. But if I, I'm, doing a, I'm doing synchronous send, remember it's like making a phone call of Message one to process B, and I'm uh, this is all sort of, sort of um, abbreviated syntax, but I'm sending a message, message one to process B, and I've tagged it with one, and I'm doing a synchronous send of message two to process B, and I've tagged it two. And process B is trying to receive them in the other order. It wants to receive a message of tag two, then a message of tag one. So I'm synchronously sending a tag one, then a tag two, but process B wants to receive the tag two, then the tag one what is going to happen here? And again, it's not obvious, different message passing systems might have different definitions here. But the MPI takes a particular, takes a particular, um, okay, let's see how we do, most people have answered. Okay, so the right answer is the code is guaranteed to deadlock. Um, the reason for that, it's not obvious, but the, so, so, Answers B and C are, are sensible answers, but not quite correct in this context. So I'll come back to situations where that might happen. But the reason that this deadlocks is for two reasons. First of all, synchronous send is like making a phone call. The synchronous send does not return until the message is received. So when process A makes a synchronous send to process B, it will only complete if process B issues a receive that matches that send. And if you look, process B is saying, I want to receive a message from process A of tag equals two. And tags are, are, are requirements. That receive says, I am going to sit here forever until I receive a message from process A, which is tag equals two. Unfortunately, process A can't, 
is going to send a message of tag two, but it can never get there because the first one it sent was tag one, which is blocking. So this, this code is guaranteed to deadlock. Okay, and that's for, for three reasons. One is that the send is synchronous. In other words, it doesn't complete until receive is posted. B is because the receive is synchronous, it doesn't complete until the send is posted. And C, the tag is actually a requirement. It's saying I require the message to be of tag two. On the receiving side, it's, it's a mandated requirement and that doesn't match. So this is not an obvious answer, I think, but um, so as I said, I should show the explanation here. The tag you specify on the receive is a requirement. So the receive blocks with tag equals two. You might think, why doesn't A go on to the next send? Well, it's blocked as well because it's synchronous send. So let's explore this a bit more. The next question is, okay, I'll get around that problem of it being synchronous, okay? Um, I'm going to um, send a, um, an, a non-blocking send uh, sorry, an asynchronous send of tag equals one, and then a, another a message of tag equals one. So what I'm saying here is that process A is issuing two sends, and because I'm using a, um, a non-blocking, um, they will both be sent at the same time. So it's, uh, think of process A running ahead of process B. So process A has sent two messages, both tagged one. Process B is receiving two messages, and it both, both wants to be tagged one. Which one will it receive? So at the point where, just think of the situation where process B is, is running a bit slow. So the point that process B issues its receive, there are two messages coming in from process A, which are seem to be indistinguishable. So what happens here? Okay, so most people have answered, so let's see what happened. How did we do? Okay, so, so both of these are perfectly reasonable answers. So both people, have, everyone's got the, the really got the, the core of the, the the point. The point is, does MPI remember the order the messages were sent in? If MPI doesn't remember the order the messages were sent in, then the answer would be E. Both received complete, but their contents are undefined, and that would that's a perfectly sensible answer. But actually. MPI remembers what order the messages were sent in. And so the correct answer is receive message one and send message one, and receive message two equals send message two, answer C. Answer E is a perfectly reasonable answer, but MPI, it may not be obvious, MPI remembers the order. So I'm, you might think that MPI sending messages with ACE, with these non-blocking operators is a bit like posting a letter. Well, it is. You fire off the message and you carry on doing what you want. But actually, under the hood, MPI remembers the order they were sent in. So when process B does its first receive, MPI receive, receive message one A tag equals one, there will potentially be two messages waiting there, but it will receive the one that was sent first. And it may be a bit subtle, but if you think about it, there are a lot of situations, you kind of, un, you may not be aware of this fact that MPI remembers message ordering, but you kind of rely on it. You can think of a lot of situations, I don't really have time to go into it here, but you can think of a lot of situations where if messages were not ordered, you would actually have a problem. Um, the classic example might be you might send a message and then you might, I said you can do this other ways, but a classic, you might send a message, you might send another message afterwards saying, by the way, uh, no, the other way around. You want to send somebody a message of unknown size. So the first thing you do is you send the message saying, I'm going to send you a message of eight inches. You send a message which contains the number eight and then you send the message so that so the receiver knows it's got a, a message of size eight. It can allocate the correct space in advance. If those messages overtook each other, then then all hell would break loose. So actually, the important point here is MPI remembers the order that the messages were sent in and matches them in order as a kind of a tiebreaker. And there are quite a few situations where that actually um, where you rely on that, even though you may think you don't. So that was a slightly subtle one. Let's go on to the next question. Uh, someone's asked, asked a question. So the um, somebody said I'd use unique tags. That's a very good point. So yeah, so uh, uh, it, uh, there were message passing systems in the past which did not have message ordering, and therefore to get this to get the behavior I had there, you had to use tags. Yeah. So. You will see a lot of people using tags in MPI programs to make sure this is 
the correct behavior. In fact, in a lot of situations, not always, in a lot of situations, those tags aren't required because message ordering saves you. But you're right, if you want to, if you want to be absolutely certain, then you would use tags. And as I said, in previous message passing systems, which didn't have message uh, order preservation, people use tags all the time. I think PVM, uh, people use tags. That's a very good point. So consider the following pseudocode. Remember that I send non blocking immediate send. What happens at runtime? So here, what I've done is I've done a different thing. I've tagged them separately. So MP, I met process A is running ahead. It sent two messages. Um, it sent, so the message with tag one and tag two are in flight. Process B is trying to receive them, but it, it's receiving them in the opposite order. So at the point where process B issues the receive, for tag equals two, um, there, are, there, are, there are two messages in the inbox, but they're in the opposite order. The first message is tag equals one. What happens here? So people often say MPI preserves the order of messages. Well, that's true, but how true is it? So I think most people have answered here, so I'll go ahead. So, so the right answer is the receive message, receive message one, send message one, and receive message and message two. Some people say MPI preserves message ordering, but that's not entirely true. You can receive messages out of order from what they were sent. The statement that MPI preserves message ordering is a statement that, it, it, that it's used as a tiebreaker. If your receive matches more than one incoming message, then it will match the earliest one first. However, you don't have to receive the messages in order. So, because that, so process A has sent a tag equals one message and a tag equals two message, tag one, tag two. Process B can choose to receive them the opposite order, tag two, then tag, tag one if it wants. And so actually, the, the, some people think here the code might deadlock, but that's not true. So uh, most people got that. In fact, they're matched. Uh, they're matched correctly, but if you think about this, you're actually receiving the messages in the in the opposite order to what they were sent. So, so the simple statement that MPI preserves message ordering is not always true. You can receive them out of order. What's really true is that MPI remembers the order they were sent, and as a tiebreaker, as a, it will receive the one. So, if a receive matches more than one message, then it will receive them in time order. However, here it matches. You can actually choose to to to, to receive them out of order. Hopefully that was some. Um... So now I'm going to a few more slightly contrived questions. So hopefully these make sense. Uh, oh, this is the final one on tagging. Okay. What happens if I do this? I send a tag one message and I send a tag two message. They're both in flight at the same time. And I've kind of given the answer away here, I think, but I, I receive them with a wild card. So I'm just saying, so at the point when process B issues to receive, there are two messages sitting there in the inbox. Um, but I, I'm saying I don't care. I'll receive any of them. Which is it? What happens here? So everyone's answered. Let's have a look. So again, this, this is not an obvious one at all. I'll show the explanation. Hopefully you can see that if I scroll down enough. So E looks like a perfectly reasonable answer. Both receive complete, but their contents are undefined. What what you think there is that when you do a wild card. Then, it, then it, it, it's the Wild West. But actually, at the point when process B issues its first receive, it matches both those messages, both tags. But as I said, MPI then decides which one to receive by looking at the time, well, the time, and it will receive them in time order. So again, although E is, a, for a general message part, if I told you I've got a message passing system, it's not called MPI, which of these behaviors will happen? E is a perfectly reasonable answer. It just happens that MPI, as a tiebreaker, does use the timestamp on the message. And so it will say, receive message one equals send message one, and receive message two equals send message two. It will receive them in the order they were sent, even though you've wildcarded. So again, it's possible that there is more than one message in the inbox if you have this, if you think of MPI as being an inbox model. Message ordering is preserved even with wildcarding, which is not obvious at all. That's why I asked this question. It's the next question which is somewhat contrived, so I'll kind of explain what it does. The next question is effectively the same answer, but 
wild carding from different sources. So what I've said here is a slightly contrived code, but I'll try and explain. Um, so consider the following pseudocode. Now, while I'm arranging, I've got a somewhat a somewhat contrived code is here, but basically the co if you see that no, the code is written so the or time ordering is that send A sends first, B sends second, and then C receives. So I've got the same situations I had in the previous example, but I'm not wildcarding on tag, I'm wildcarding on source. So if you just look at process C, when process C exit the barrier, it's what we've what we've achieved is that there are potentially two messages waiting for it, one from A and one from B. I am saying I don't care who I received from, but we know that A was sent before B. So we know, and MPI probably knows, that process A sent the message before process B. So what happens here? What you might think is C. So C seems the obvious answer. C is the obvious answer if you say, well, David just told me that in, uh, in, 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 if all else fails, MPI uses the timestamp as a, a tiebreaker. Now, I mean, actually, I should, I, that was not actually true. That's true for tagging, but not for sending. In fact, in this case, both receives complete, but their contents are undefined. The, 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 the time ordering statement is only true between the stream of messages between one sender and one receiver. So MPI remembers the time ordering of, 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 of all the messages between a pair of processes. So between a particular pair of processes, they're remembered. The time ordering is preserved. However, between two senders, MPI has no concept of a global time. And so between two senders, there, there is no time ordering in there. It will not do that. It, it will basically, in this case, both receives complete, but their contents are undefined. And if you think about it, the analogy I use is imagine that um, I'm on a holiday in Australia and I'm sending, um, this is the tag example, I'm sending um, postcards to my mother and I want my mother to receive them, to read them in the order I sent them. I can do that by labeling my postcards, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So the, 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 the issue here is you have to uh, realize that the hardware doesn't preserve message ordering. Modern hardware, because of dynamic routing, messages can arrive out of order. Just like my postcards can arrive out of order when I send them to my mother. How can I guarantee that if the postcards arrive out of order, my mother will read them in order? Well, I just have to number my postcards, one, two, three, four, five. So my, mom, my mother gets postcard five, she reads it. Then she gets a postcard numbered seven. She knows, no, no, I'm not going to read that. I'm going to wait because there must be a postcard six on the way. If you think about it, that doesn't work when you have two senders, okay? So I'm in Australia, my brother's in Canada. I post a letter, um, a postcard to my mother. Then a the day later, my brother postcards a letter to my mother, which is the, the uh, uh, sent a postcard to my mother. That's the situation here. My mother then gets um, my brother's, um, my, bro my mother then gets my one first. My one goes faster in the mail. For some reason, mail from, from Australia is faster than mail from Canada. There is no way that she can know that there's a message from my brother in the network. So if MPI was to guarantee, uh, um, uh, if MPI was to guarantee behavior C, which you might want, it would have to basically wait forever or have some global view of all the messages which are going on the network or have a central repository of all the messages that have been sent or received. And that's just not possible. So you could write a, a message passing system where C was guaranteed, but it would be an enormous overhead. So you can, you can efficiently maintain the time order of messages between a single send, sender and receiver by having an increment encounter. But there's no simple way without having a global overview uh, of maintaining global message ordering. Um, uh, so uh, this, is, this is a bit of a trick question, but uh, uh, E is the correct answer. So I don't know if my explanation was useful there, but uh, it's a bit of a trick question, but... Um, so which question was that question? What question are we on now? I've got about, I think I've got 20 questions or 21 or two. Let's go to the next one. Uh, 
This is one where I think my answer is correct, but I, I tried to grab our MPI expert just before the, 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 um, the uh, seminar and he wasn't available. But, this, so, but at least this is one where we can discuss. Consider the following pseudocode. Uh, oh, uh, I, the comment's wrong there. So apologies for, uh, uh, you don't need to remember that I send as a non-blocking media. So that, that's a silly, uh, that should be. Which of the following possible outcomes when, when we send 10 integers and receive 10 real numbers? Process A says MPI send, B send message one, 10 integers. And process B says MPI receive A, receive message one, 10 MPI floats. So the reason I've picked integers and floats is they're probably both four bytes. So I've sent 40 bytes, 10 integers, and I'm trying to receive 40 bytes, 10 floats. But what happens here? So my answers are based on what I've seen real MPI implementations do. I realize that I should, um, I'm not, so this is my, I, this is one maybe up for discussion, but um, so what happens if I ten, send 10 integers, which is, which is 40 bytes, and let's assume I receive 10 floats, which is also 40 bytes. Okay, what did we do? Okay, so A, the call is erroneous for MPI reports an error. That is a possible outcome. However, I've never seen an MPI implementation which does that. So you would, you would, I believe it is, this is an allowable outcome, but MPI doesn't do it. And um, the reason MPI doesn't do it is data type matching is quite complicated. Um, and so technically this is an erroneous call. And so the error, the behavior is undefined, but in practice, MPI could complain, but it no, I've never seen MPI implementation that, that complained. What normally happens is D, the message is delivered, but the contents to receive message one are potentially garbage. So if you send integers and receive floats, it will match, but um, the contents are garbage. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that the tag and the data type are interpreted completely differently. The tag is used in message matching. Okay, so if you ask for a message of tag one, it waits for a message of tag one. The data type does not enter into message matching. MPI does not say, um, so, E, the send does not match, release the receive keeps waiting for a message of type M. That's a perfectly reasonable answer, and that would be the right answer if these were tags. But MPI doesn't use the data type in message matching. And the reason is that actually whether two messages have compatible data types is a subtle question because you can define your own data types. And so it's not immediately obvious if two data types match. That's a bit of a subtle point. But what, off, what actually happens in most MPI implementations is D. The message is delivered, but the contents of received message ones are potentially garbage, not E, and because uh, MPI does not use the data type when it matches up messages, which may be, is not obvious, non obvious, but it, they are fundamentally treated differently from tags. Um, they, they're not a requirement, they're not used in message matching. So I don't know if that's clear. Um, what some people say is B. And again, MPI could do that. MPI could say, well, he sent in and he's receiving floats. I'll convert them. But MPI doesn't do that. But MPI could do that, but it doesn't. And the correct answer is D is the most likely answer. A is possible, but E does not happen for uh, because data types are treated fundamentally different from, from things like tags. I don't know if anyone has any questions on that, but it was really to try and illustrate that point. The call is erroneous. What I said now. Okay, let's do the next question. I think we're almost finished and we're almost on time. Next question. Um, some MPI collector calls specify both the sender and the receive type, e.g., if you do a scatter, you're effectively specifying the send and the receive in the same call. You have a send buffer, a send count, and a send type, and a receive buffer, receive count, and a receive type. But in almost all the times you see MPI at people calling, M say MPI scatter, if they're scattering integers, they will be receiving integers. If they're scattering floats, they'll be receiving floats. In the vast majority of times you see this, we will have send type equals receive type and also send count equals receive count. So why does MPI make you specify both types? It seems like overkill. If I'm sending integers, surely I'm receiving integers. 
I'm specifying them both in the same call. Why do I have to specify them separately? So most people answered, how did we do? So people have got the, um, the right answer that, that um, it's to do with message matching. Um, but the, the, so both C and D are reasonable answers. But in fact, the types and counts can be different provided one of these is a derived data type. Um, the types can be different provided the two buffs are the same length. And now I've given that answer, then I'm, and it's almost right, but it's not quite right. I've got, I've got, it's to do with MPI derived types. You may not know about derived types, but I've put the explanation here. Uh, data type matching MPI is surprisingly subtle, but the MPI data types don't have to match. They have to be compatible. Technically, MPI calls it the same type signature. But the important point is MPI, you, in MPI, you can call create, you can create composite types. So I could create an MPI derived type called MPI 3 vec, which contained three integers. If I send one MPI 3 vec, I'm allowed to receive that as three integers. So there the send type and the receive type are different. I've sent an MPI 3 vec, which I've defined myself, and I've received three MPI integers, or MPI ints, I should probably say here for, for C. However, because the messages both contain three integers, they match. And so if you only have used uh, only the built-in um, uh, native types, then yes, send type has to be receive type and send count has to be receive count. However, because you can play funny games with data types, then actually they don't have to be the same. And, and there are, there are um, places where this can be useful. It can allow you to um, uh, scatter data from a contiguous array into a non-contiguous array subsection by using vectors and stuff like that. But it, it's just really to try, to try and illustrate the fact that MPI data type matching is not completely trivial. Um, if the message contains three integers and the, if the send message contains three integers and the receive message is asking for three integers, they match, although they may have been defined in different ways. And these are games you can play with MPI data types. So that's something I was trying to, um, so question here. This will go with the components of the drive. Ah, so, well, you're thinking here of the derived type of being um, a, a um, something like a, a structure or, an, or, or a Fortran derived type. That, where this really enters in, what I'm really thinking about here is where the derived type is, is an array subject, like an MPI type vector. So this really enters into situations where the derived types are all of the same type integers, but they maybe have gaps in them. So I'm really thinking about, so for example, situations where you might have a data type like a vector which has gaps, and you might send four integers and receive them with gaps in. That's okay as long as there are four integers. It works with the current of the drive type at the same time. So yes, if you're if you're talking about sending structures or an MPI, they're called derive type somewhat confusingly, then uh, the matching rules are a bit more strict. So in fact, um, I think I don't. The, I was really in my back of my mind here had a situation we were sending. Um, uh, types which contained all the same type, i.e. all integers, but their positions were messed around, like they could be compound types with three integers, or they could be vectors, which might be integers with gaps in them. So uh, I should maybe make that a bit more explicit. Yeah, so so the, the, just to go a bit further, that if, you, if you're a C program and you have a, a structure and you define a derived type which defines that structure where you specify what the type and, and displacement of all the elements are, this data type matching is still relevant because MPI actually in principle allows you to send messages between two different computers which might be running different operating systems, different compilers. And if you if you know C, the C language doesn't specify what a structure looks like. The compiler can add arbitrary padding in there. And so actually this matching allows um, secure communications of, of MPI structures or C structures between heterogeneous architectures because although they may look different on the two architectures. One compiler might have inserted padding, the other one might not have. They match up in the sense that they're that the um, uh, that they're all of the same. That the, the, the components are of the same type. Okay. So uh, the next question, I think this might be the last one. Okay, this is the closest I have to a trick question, but 
I've got a simple reduction operation here or reduce all the even processes are calling the uh, the top reduce so that the even process they're calling MPI or reduce and they're supplying their rank and they're, they're, they're putting that into the into the into the variable even sum so we're adding up all that call is all the um, even numbered processes are adding up their ranks and the second call is all the odd number processes are adding up their ranks and so the first the sum of the first some of all the even numbers is not plus two plus four plus six which is 12 and all the odd numbers one plus three plus five plus seven which is which is 16 let's do how did we do okay so somebody's just got their even the odd the wrong way around um but the 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 obvious thing you might say is the even sum is 12 and odd sum is 16. the way this this is the closest i have to a trick question okay it looks like the even process is adding up their ranks which would give you naught plus two plus four plus six which is 12 and the odd process is adding up their ranks which is one plus three plus five plus seven which would be um 16. But actually, the crucial thing is the all reduce is specifying the communicator of MPI com world. Both of these calls are, are saying across MPI com world. So every process is making one call to MPI all reduce. But if you think about it, the MPI library doesn't know that. The MPI, because MPI is a library, all it knows is that all the processes are calling MPI on reduce. It doesn't know, MPI doesn't, doesn't care that, that some of them called them from this line and the other half called them from this line. Because it's on MPI com world, you're saying we're all taking part in the reduction. So actually, although this has been written, this, this is a, something of a trick question, but a couple of people spotted it. Actually, all these, these reduces are the same reduce. So actually, everybody, is adding up all the ranks. And so the answer is the sum of all the ranks, which is 28. So actually, even sum is 28 and odd sum is 28. So a couple of people spotted that. It's not obvious at all. But the, the, the reason I put this example in is that if MPI were a compiler, it might be able to say, well, I'll match all these all reduces with each other. I'll match all these with each other. Because MPI is a library, it does not know where these calls came from. All it knows is that everybody is calling the all reduce. So it just does the all reduce across everybody. If you wanted these to be separate all reduces, if you wanted, if you wanted to reduce the even and the odd processes separately, you would have to split the communicator into even and odd communicators. And there's a thing called MPI com split to do that. But because both of these reduction operations refer to MPI com world, they all end up being the same reduction. Does that? Um, and this can be useful. It, it, you, you don't have reduction operations, global operations match regardless of what line of code they're called from. All that matters is that they're in the same communicator. So I don't have any questions about that, but that's, as I said, the, the closest I have to a quick question. I think I put a little explanation here. What did I say? Yeah. This is the closest I have to a quick question. They're all passed in the same global thing. I think I have one more real question, which is this one, which is a slightly, slightly um, text question, but it's a bit more opinion than, than fact-based. But as you do, you receive an MPI program from a colleague and there's lots of calls to MPI barrier, okay? Which of these are likely plausible explanations of why this person has put so many barriers in? I was saying, assuming the program uses relative standards, two side the MPI functionality and doesn't push the boundaries of the standard. What I mean is you've written a fairly standard send and receive. You're not doing these weird MPI puts and gets. It's you've just it's a standard M code, which uses MPI send, receive, I send, I receive, maybe uses collectives. But the person's put lots of barriers in there. Why? What are plausible explanations of why there are so many barriers? How did we do? Often A is true. The barriers are required. To, so, so if you want to time an MPI program, you often want to put a barrier in because you want to say, look, um, I want, uh, I want to time it. And, and timing in a parallel program, you know, how long, you know, me and my wife went to work today. How long did it take us to get to work? That's not obviously a well-defined question because we may have left at different times. So if you're timing an MPI program, it's often very useful to have a barrier so everyone is lined up on the start line at the same place. However, it's a subtle point, but MPI barriers are almost never required for program correctness. So the barriers are required to ensure that subsequent collective operations can be called safely. You often see this. You, people say, call MPI barrier, call MPI reduce. You do not need that barrier. Because 
collective operations do all the synchronization which is required. So you do not need barrier reduce, okay? The barriers required for program credits because it uses lots of non-blocking operations. Again, you often see people saying MPI barrier, you know, wait till everyone gets it. In fact, because of the matching rules of MPI and the way that things work out, even if you're using non-blocking communications, you almost never need barriers. C is the usual, is actually the most common answer. The barriers that are necessary can safely be removed if the program is otherwise correct. What I mean is that people are very conservative and you often see people putting in barriers. As I said, they'll say, make, you know, make sure everyone's got to this point before I call the collective operation. You do not need that barrier because the collective operation will do all the synchronization you need. And if you use non-blocking communications, correctly, although they are complicated because they can be going in the background, a barrier doesn't help you. Um, there is no global clock in MPI. Um, and so, you know, everyone's running independently, although you might make, make you give a, a nice feeling to know that all your MPI processes are lined up at the same time. Um, they don't necessarily exit the barrier at the same time. You call a barrier, one process could exit that barrier 10 minutes for another one. All a barrier says is that no process shall leave this barrier till every process has entered. But in fact, they could all leave at certainly different, completely different times. So actually, my experience is, in almost all cases, people's barriers are unnecessary and you can remove them, program will go faster. So I mean, that, it's, it, that's maybe not obvious. And in other programming models like PGAS models or OpenMP shared memory models, barriers are absolutely crucial for program correctness. In MPI, they're almost never needed for program correctness. And it's a slightly subtle point, but um, people do overuse barriers and they're almost never needed, except for the case where you want to get a consistent timing. So that's really all I had. Um, I hope you found that useful. Um, I just had a silly question at the end. Um, so I hope the technology worked for it, it seemed to work. Um, and I, as I said, we've recorded this. Th this quiz is based on a couple of quizzes I've given on my introduction in advanced MPI courses. Um, they are, you know, people tend to do quite well on when I give them during the course, because to, to be honest, I teach the test. These are questions I ask because I've seen that people often uh, misunderstand things in MPI. Uh, but hopefully, um, hopefully you found that useful. I'm glad you all find it, you did all find it useful. Um, so I've lost, HPC Chris said, that was good. very useful, I can immediately see, sorry, I, I lost the end of that comment. Uh, I don't know if it just got truncated. Um, I can, but um, but uh, the technology seemed to hold up and um, yeah, I hope you found that useful. Okay, bye everybody. Thanks everyone, bye-bye.